I think we as medical directors sometimes lose sight of this idea that a lot of what we do relies on the paramedic or the EMT or the guy that's actually out in the field or the gal that's out in the field to actually make something happen. And in the end, we can do all the training. We can write protocols, you know, for the smartest person or for the dumbest person or for the most lazy person. But in the end, it really depends on who it is that's out there that's doing it. And that's one of the hard things, but also one of the liberating things about working in EMS, especially from a medical director standpoint, is that I can sort of say, yeah, these are the guidelines. You should follow them. But I'm not only going to trust you to do it, I have to trust you to use your best judgment. And I can't write you a protocol for everything. So you're going to have to figure it out. And if we can't trust our people to do that, then the system doesn't work. Likewise, when we come back from a time when maybe the judgment wasn't so great and we're standing around in the light of day in a 72 degree office where it's well lit and there's nobody screaming at us, we have to kind of bear in mind that this was on us most of the time. But when we come back to, you know, review a case and we're all sitting around a well-lit desk in a 72-degree office with low relative humidity and nobody's yelling at us or threatening us or anything like that, that our judgments can be a little bit different. And we have to respect that everybody is, generally speaking, trying to do the right thing at the right time. Now, if somebody is dangerous, somebody's dangerous. But I found that that's really not the case. And with even a modicum of education, most people will rise uh, to at least an acceptable level. And most people that are out there, their judgment is not terrible. It may not be the same as, say, a physician who's been working 20 years in the same place and has seen all these cases a hundred times, but it's pretty good. And it generally does err on the side of doing what they think is best for the patient. Now, that said, I wanted to talk today about something that has been on my mind for a little bit. And I think we've got a way to fix it, but it's going to be a little bit different than what we're used to. And part of fixing it is going to involve embracing the uh, monster that a lot of people have had out there, which is the use of paralytics and sedation by non-critical care EMS uh, providers. So how do we make the most dangerous thing we do by far a little safer? We make it more dangerous, but we also change the way that we do it. The, excuse me, the press and the written word is not terribly kind to paramedics when it comes to airway management. And you might ask, well, what's the problem? Why is this so hard? Well, let's break it down because, you know, as far as we know, anesthesiologists can do it and doctors can do it and probably emergency medicine doctors and surgeons and everybody else is doing it. What's your guys' problem? Here's the issue. The field is different, and anybody who's tried to intubate in the field knows that it's different. What are some of the reasons for that? Well, let's look at the provider themselves. Uh, how prepared is this guy to intubate? Not like, did he get ready on the, on the ride out to the scene, but like, how much schooling has he actually had on this? How much formal training has he actually had on intubation? How many times has he actually done this while supervised and in training? For most of our paramedic students, it's going to be one time. Like one live intubation is all you need, and the rest can all be done on a human patient simulator or something like that, and then you can kind of fudge it with like labs and things. So they may have intubated, you know, 60 pieces of plastic, but 60 pieces of plastic never got hurt as a result of it, and depending on the quality of your instructor and the quality of your setup, there may not have been any consequences for doing the absolutely wrong things. <clears throat> so we don't give people a great preparation to start with us. And then when we start talking about co ongoing competency, how many of us have gone out and gone back to the OR or gone back to the emergency department and intubated more live people once you got out of school? Uh, the answer is probably about zero. And that's a big problem because we don't have the we don't have the ongoing preparation to do this uh, safely. We just don't give that to people. That's not, that's not your fault as a paramedic. It's just the opportunity's not been out there for most of us. All right, how about the patient themselves? Well, uh, there's a reason this patient is being intubated in the field. So they don't have normal physiology to start off with. Either they already are crashing, or there's vomit all over the place, or they're a uh, you know 600-pound person with some kind of neck mass and a bunch of broken teeth uh, that just got thrown off of an ATV. These patients are not the good patients that we can sort of electively say, yes, probably, okay, no, we're going to fiber optically that one. Uh, that's not the case in, uh, in EMS. Those aren't our patients. <clears throat> how about positioning? We're sort of less 
left where the patient lies a lot of times. Now, we could probably do better, and I'll talk about that. But if you have to intubate an infant in a car seat, uh, that's not something that probably an anesthesiologist has ever had to do. And so your success rates may be different. Um, likewise, if the guy's attached to the ceiling, like the, the airway rodeos, which I, I think are kind of silly, but nonetheless... Um, <clears throat> If the patient is not in the standard position, that makes it harder and less likely for you to get in the right spot. How about the equipment? How many of you have video laryngoscopy? How many of you use video laryngoscopy every time? How many of you are really, really, really comfortable with it and have an array of extra tools to help you out, like a bougie, like uh, a different stylet, like a rigid stylet, as well as a regular stylet? Um, do you have all the equipment out there and are you trained to use it? For a lot of us, the answer is no, not really. How about preconditioning of the patient? Again, did we prepare them? These folks uh, are not fasted. They did not spend you know, every hour after midnight not eating or drinking before this happened. There's spaghetti, pieces of chewed up spaghetti all over the place. There's meatballs in the guy's mouth. There's blood. Uh, as I said, there's teeth. These guys are not ready to be intubated, yet we're trying to make you do it anyway. How about our protocol? Sometimes they intentionally make it harder, not intentionally make it harder, but by trying to do the right thing and say, oh, you can't say give paralytics to decrease tone and make it less likely the patient's going to vomit and increase your first pass success, they say, no, you can't give paralytics to these patients. They'll stop breathing. Our protocols sometimes make it harder on ourselves. Likewise, they don't really address uh, the situation in the field a lot of times because it's written by, who's it written by? Us, by doctors who practice in the hospital. So our protocols uh, are not always doing us favors. I mentioned paralytics already. We'll skip past it. And then I sort of mentioned practice too. Do you go out and do you actually intubate, uh, if you're going to intubate mannequins for practice, how many of them have you actually intubated in the last year? Probably not that many. All right, how many patients have you actually intubated in the last year? If you look at one of my services, um, we've got a, a you know, decently robust service, like five ambulances, 8,000, 8,500 calls a year, something like that. Um, how much does each person get to intubate? There's maybe 20 of them that have gotten an attempt to intubate in the last year and they mostly got one shot, one attempt. Uh, now, some of them are using superglottic airways, and I understand that, but the person who got the most attempts at it uh, had five. One was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one was successful, two were failed attempts on the same patient, and then there were two other attempts. The next person has gotten three, and then everybody else has gotten an average of about 1.5 attempts in a year. So you intubate one patient a year, you can't keep up your skills that way. Uh, and that's, again, not anybody's fault. It just is what it is. So that said, I will posit that when it comes to airways, you have a human right to aggressive, safe, comprehensive airway management if you are attended to by an ambulance. And this isn't actually a human right, I'm just saying it. Of course, <clears throat> if you uh, are on an ambulance, if you have an ambulance crew, if you attend to patients in the field, you ought to be able to manage uh, the airway aggressively and completely. Now, I recognize that not every EMT is going to be able to intubate, and I'm not saying that they should, but let's put it at the now the paramedic level, which is kind of the standard for like when you really talk about airway management, although EMTs can do great basic airway management and is probably the best thing 80-85% of the time. There are folks out there that we're going to need a paramedic to be able to intubate. I would thus say that given that paralytics are the thing that make it easy for everybody as well as sedation, uh, because you're a jerk if you don't, uh, RSI is a thing that everybody should have access to in the field. Okay, cool. I like that idea. Hopefully you're cheering at home right now and saying, yes, this is the guy. Let's get him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lovers, 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 lovers. All sounds good, right? We, I looked at what it would cost to implement this. And let's say that in order to do this safely, that you have to do 10 intubations to start with, 10, 10 RSI intubations to start with, at least a couple on a person, but say that you did it all on human patient simulators. 10 initially, and then let's say 10 a year for competency. Uh, if you, again, take a moderate size EMS service, uh, let's call it 50 people or so, what this works out to assuming a fire-based service where you have other obligations and that kind of stuff, but you can also compel people, but you still have to pay them. We figured out that this would probably take about three and a half years to get everybody through uh, 10 reps, and it would probably cost somewhere in the neighborhood of about $3 million for a moderate-sized service. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of time. And by that point, we've probably cycled out, you know, 20% of our people. They've gone someplace else or they've uh, graduated back up to a uh, fire truck where they wanted to be in the first place. Okay, 
So is there something else we can do then? Uh, what else you got? Let's say instead of RSI for all, we, we tone it down a little bit and say rapid sequence airway. Let's not focus necessarily on the intubation part, but let's give you the tools uh, to make the airway happen uh, and do that completely and aggressively and fully and with good training. Now, I have to say that uh, these two folks, I stole a lot of what I'm going to be talking about from their ideas. On the right is uh, my right, yeah, no, sorry. On your left is Darren Brody, uh, <clears throat> who um, was the first person to publish on uh, rapid sequence airway, where uh, one of his flight crews said, we're going to push paralytics and sedation, but then we're just going to stick in an eye gel. And guess what? It worked. We are sometimes giving medicine that will drop your blood pressure. Uh, we shouldn't be if we do it right, but sometimes it happens. At the other end of the spectrum, the patient is not spontaneously breathing. If they're completely aptic, they're drug overdose or whatever, we're going to intubate them. Uh, we should go ahead and bag them. We shouldn't have this fear that uh, you're going to hurt the person by bagging them as, as either you are attempting to pre-oxygenate them or as you're attempting to, uh, you know, as you give them the drugs and let them, let them settle out and paralyze and uh, get sedated. <clears throat> Stick the, non, or stick the mask on the patient, use good technique, have two people because you cannot hold a mask seal no matter what anybody else says. You cannot hold a mask seal with one person in an emergency setting uh, and, and do a good job. So two people are on the bag, one person's holding the seal, the other person's doing gentle, uh, relatively low tidal volume breaths, just enough to get the patient's chest to rise. And we've got a peep valve on there and it's set at at least five, probably 10 if it's the mechanical peep valves that uh, everybody is, everybody's used to using. And we're going to uh, oxygenate that guy until we get his sat up. Now, if you also look at this uh, picture down in the lower right corner, what you see is, by the way, uh, again, for the head injured patient, we may say, oh man, I don't want to put CPAP on him. His GCS is 12. Uh, he's confused. He, his GCS won't tolerate that. Realistically, that's not an issue we're not going to put the CPAP on the person and then walk away from him uh, and go do something else around the emergency department or go back into the station, get a cup of coffee or something. We are putting this on him because he's pretty sick and we're going to be watching him like a hawk and we're going to be sitting next to the guy to start off with. <clears throat> if his GCS is seven and you can get him to wear a CPAP mask and it makes him a little better, that's fine. You could probably even make the case transport this person in that case uh, if, he, if he's doing a little bit better. <clears throat> but you are sitting, the key is you're sitting there watching the person for any of the bad stuff that might happen and you can pull the mask off if you have to. But in the meantime, it will continue to give him some peep, open up his lung segments, make everything a little bit better uh, or potentially a lot better as you are getting ready to intubate him if you still run down that aisle or still run down that, uh, that lane. And by the way, one more time, if uh, there is no contraindication, realistically, in emergency airway management to bagging the patient while they are getting sedated or paralyzed. So we, we have this thing like, oh man, you're not, supposed to, you're not supposed to bag the person because you're going to insufflate the stomach and then you're going to increase, increase the chance of vomiting. Well, I mean, if you're like going crazy on this person and King Kong in the bag with them, then yeah, that might happen. But from a practical standpoint, you decrease the chance of critical hypoxemia and you uh, increase the chance the patient is not going to get hypoxic if you bag the patient if they need it. So if their SAT is 80 and uh, you've decided to push paralytics for whatever reason, there's no reason to stop uh, squeezing the bag at that point just because they're now getting paralyzed and somebody's told you're not supposed to do that. If their SAT is 90, uh, there's no reason that you can't keep squeezing the bag. But again, do it well. Get a good seal. Gentle squeezes, uh, relatively low tidal volume, just enough to get a little chest rise uh, out of it. Don't go crazy with it. Uh, good, good positioning to start with <clears throat> and things will get better. So we cannot uh, start hypoxic. If we start intubating these patients hypoxic, then they're going to get worse, and those are the folks that are going to go into cardiac arrest uh, if, they're not, if not from hypotension. But there are some folks that we're just not going to be able to get not hypoxic. If you can't not start hypoxic, then simply don't use an ET tube. Why? Because an ET tube takes time to place. You have to be careful with it. You've, you know, you've got uh, stuff you have to watch out for. If you can't not be hypoxic, uh, then don't use an ET tube. Use a superglottic airway, which goes in super fast and works almost all the time, <clears throat> at least in most people. Um, now, it may not work for everyone, and by the way, the IGEL, uh, IGEL is the German word for hedgehog, which is the first thing if you Google IGEL, what it comes up is cute little pictures of hedgehogs, so that's the joke. 
Have I got it? <laughs> All right, anyway, back to it. Intense again. Don't start hypoxic. <clears throat> Let's put the number at 93. If you can pre-oxygenate the patient above 93%, you're okay to use an ET tube until their SAT gets below 93, at which, pay, at which case you should stop and switch over to a superglottic airway. Superglottic airway of your choice. IGEL is good. Uh, I never really had that much problem with the king, honestly. Uh, but switch over to your superglottic airway uh, when you reach 93. Don't wait till it gets to 88. Don't wait till it gets to 85. Don't like pre reoxygenate and then try to do it again. When you get to 93, hard stop, superglottic airway goes in. If you've never pre-oxygenated above 93%, then use the supraglottic airway when you start. And again, why? Because it goes in fast and it works almost all the time. And what it may allow you to do is oxygenate the patient better, get a little more pressure in on them, uh, oxygenate them until they get up to, say, 100%, some reasonable thing. And if you think that the, the eye gel is not working at that point, okay, he's at 100%. Now you're above 93, you can try to intubate him again until he gets back down to 93, in which case stick the eye gel back in. Now going back and forth is probably not a great idea. So most of the time when you get to eye gel territory, it's eye gel goes in, eye gel works, uh, and you take that into the patient, into the hospital. That is fine. Like that, that is not a problem as long as they did not get hypoxic. That's not a failed attempt. That's going down, uh, going down the pathway in the way that we're teaching you to do it. If you are not hypoxic, if you are above 93%, you can go ahead and try to use an endotracheal tube to manage the airway if you think it's indicated. Or you could just put a superglottic airway in again. But let's say that you, for some reason, uh, have decided that you can't do that and you've got to go with the ET tube. If we're going to try to intubate somebody, we're going to make the first shot the best shot. Uh, the way we're going to do that, we are going to need to use an airway checklist in one way or another. Make up your own or steal one from somebody. We're going to make great patient positioning to start off with. We are going to use sedation and paralysis because it increases the chance that you're going to get it. And there are some people that we have all seen you can't intubate, you can't ram an eye gel in, they won't accept an oral airway, and they don't do well with a nasal airway. Uh, there are some people that we have got to be able to completely manage the airway with. And then we're going to use the bougie first. If you're smart, you will switch over to a bougie first technique because it will increase the chance you get the thing on the first shot. Here is a, a grainy picture of the air care, mobile care intubation checklist. I like, I like this. Um, when you're using a checklist, it can't just be something like, oh yeah, I sort of, I remembered this. I committed it to memory, quote unquote. If you're going to use a checklist, and you should, this is one thing from the airline industry that, yes, this is a reasonable thing to do. You get the checklist out. You are looking at the checklist. Uh, you say, you know, sterile cockpit or stop, or everybody, hold on, we're going to do the checklist. Stop what you're doing. Everybody gets quiet, uh, unless you're, like, doing CPR, uh, <clears throat> in which case, do CPR quietly, and somebody reads, your partner reads off the stuff on the uh, checklist. Um, do we have suction available? Yes, there's a call and response. Suction available, yes, uh, is sitting right here. Oxygenation, use a checklist, uh, commit to the checklist, embrace the checklist, uh, have it with you and know where it is. All right, how about patient positioning? How many of you are intubating patients flat on their back? Um, I know that I have been for a long time and I've only recently said, wait a minute, this is dumb. Uh, we should not be managing airways with patients flat on their back. We shouldn't probably even be bagging patients flat on their back. Um, <clears throat> what we should be doing is elevating head of the bed uh, at least about 30 degrees or so, 20, 30 degrees, something like that, getting their head up. They don't have to be bolt upright, but they should be up a little bit. Why? Because that'll uh, decrease, that will give you uh, better airway mechanics at the top. It will let all the potentially fluid or vomitus or whatever is in their drain down instead of coming back up. Uh, and if the patient has a super huge, you know, belly, as many of our patients do, and it doesn't take that much of a belly, no longer is the belly pushing on the diaphragm and uh, squishing the lungs, uh, or stomach for that matter, it is being driven down into the crotch and into the feet, uh, so you don't have to worry about it. So there's a lot of good reasons to uh, position somebody with head of bed elevated and do this even when you're just pre oxygenating or even if you're just bagging somebody. <clears throat> um, this is a good thing to do. How about positioning of the head itself relative to the body? Uh, props to Nicholas Crimes here for this awesome thing that I st just stole uh, off of, I think it was MCRIT's thing, uh, but it's, it's definitely theirs. Good job, guys. This looks great. This is exactly what you want to say. How do they describe this position that you see here? This is the, this is the sniffing position that we actually should be in, but what is the actual sniff? Uh, it is not just looking up like that. Um, <clears throat> this is elevate, elevation 
an extension of the neck. Basically, you're sticking your head forward and sticking your chin out. If you're going to do this on another person, you lift the head and then push it toward the patient's knees. Uh, and that gives you the elevation, extension, and translation of the head forward and will eventually work out to <clears throat> the patient's ear being parallel with the sternal notch. Now, you'll see some bastardizations of this. For instance, this was kicked around for a while. Oh, this is cool, right? Ear is parallel, or ear is, yeah, parallel in the same line. Ear is in the same line as sternal notch. There's tragus, there's sternal notch right there. Uh, all we did was raise, ramp this person up and then dangle their head on the back of the bed. This works, right? Ear, sternal notch. This is a good thing. No, this actually makes things a lot harder because now you've got even more curvature between uh, the trachea, which is sitting up here, and the oropharynx, which is back here. And when you talk about those axes or even curves or whatever it is you want to align, none of that happens here. This is dumb. This is stupid. Stop doing this. This is just dangling the patient's head over the back of the bed, which everybody knows is bad to start off with. But you've translated the, uh, the frame of reference for it. <clears throat> This is a good explanation, uh, also stolen from MCRIT, if I recall, of all the, all the positions you could have the patient in. <clears throat> Notice, just elevating the head is not enough. This is just head elevated. Um, what you actually have to do is elevate the head, elevate the shoulders, and then extend and uh, translate forward. And that smooths out this curve that makes instead of, you know, this kind of whoop like that, it's more of just a, a J. Uh, <clears throat> What they've done here is instead of ramping the patient with a pillow, they've uh, elevated the head of the bed, which is, which is okay still, uh, but they've still put towels or sheets behind the patient's head to translate it forward. You need to figure out a way to do this in, in your uh, field responses, whether that's uh, having just a stack of towels or getting buying like a memory pillow or something like that or having an airbag or something, I don't know. Um, I'm just going to say operationalize this, but we got to get the patients in that position in order to, in order to get their airway managed. And again, this is not just a <clears throat> um, something to do while you're intubating. This is a good idea while you are pre them or bagging them or anything like that. That same position is a good place to be. Let's talk a little bit about paralytics, and I won't go into it too far. Sedation and paralytics help. They make it easier to intubate. It is very difficult to intubate somebody if they're not sedated and paralyzed, uh, nigh on impossible. It is also very difficult to get a supraglottic airway in somebody who is not completely flaccid, uh, <clears throat> and RSI or sedation paralysis would help with that. There's not that many studies that actually look at emergency RSI and does it help people, but uh, in, in the sort of one that's most recent, you see that in emergency departments, if you uh, provide rapid sequence innovation versus non-rapid sequence innovation, the odds ratio is about 2 to 2.1, 2.2 in favor of RSI with the same major complication rate. So that's the way that you spin that is that uh, there's no, da no more danger to RSI and it increases the chance that you will get the tube in the right place on the first or second attempt, depending on what other means you're, you're sort of using to, to try to get the, per, get the person intubated. So uh, increases the chance you'll get the tube in the right spot early, and the complication rate is about the same. So uh, a little bit of evidence that, uh, that RSI is good. How do you operationalize some of this stuff? Well, I think instead of having to learn all the different drugs and all the different dosages and then screwing it up, make it easy. There's pretty much nobody that has a real contraindication to getting ketamine, and very few people who have a true contraindication to getting succinylcholine uh, in the field. The nice thing about ketamine and succinylcholine is that you dose them at about the same dose, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, you could do different dosages if you want, but why would you uh, fill your brain with that useless information? 1.5 and 1.5, same volume, both of them. Uh, you give them both at the same time, and then uh, both take about 1.5 minutes before the patient is completely paralyzed and uh, dissociated. Uh, so that's good. 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, ketamine and sucks. Uh, use it all the time. It is, it is my go-to for it. Yes, you probably ought to learn the dosing on rock in case you have somebody that's like terribly burned or has been in rhabdo or something like that. <clears throat> but that is so few and far between that you're just going to have to look it up regardless. By the way, it's 1.2 on rock, but it takes a little while longer to get them sedated. Or sorry, to get them paralyzed. So uh, adopt the drugs. Use the drugs. We have to let people use the drugs. Uh, but pick safe and easy and effective drugs to use. And ketamine is the one that does it for me. I talked a little bit about bougie first, mentioned it anyway. We should be using the bougie to start off with for basically all of our airways in the field. 
Why? Because it increases the chance that you're going to get in in the right uh, right place, right time uh, to start with. You'll see them come in with the bougie first here, and then they had a little hang up, and they'll just give a little bougie a turn. The use of the bougie has been shown, and at least in, in one study, um, and in a couple more that are maybe not as good quality, to increase the chance of first pass success. Increase the chance that you get the tube in the right spot on the first time. <clears throat> um, now, is that truly applicable to the field? I think it probably is, uh, but it certainly is not going to hurt. However, the one thing that we have seen is that you can't just pick up the bougie. You should, well, you should be doing bougie first. You can't just like pick the thing up for the first time and expect it's going to work flawlessly every time. You've got to train with it. So you've got to get the thing up while you're in the station, go to the airway head that everybody's got sitting around um, and practice with, practice with this job or practice getting the thing in the right spot. And it will become a lot easier to use. If you're interested in uh, learning more about using the bougie first, check out my bougie first talk uh, on emsgrandrounds.org. Almost done with the intubating part, I promise. We have said that we're not going to let the patient become hypoxic while we are intubating them, while we're doing our airway management. <clears throat> now, again, some people you're never going to get to sat above 85%, and that's just going to suck. Um, and we're going to do our best uh, to not make them any more hypoxic by going good fractionation still, using lots of non-invasive uh, positive pressure, and then going straight for a, a superglottic airway if at all possible. But during the intubation attempt, we're not going to let the patient get less than 93%. We're going to stop when their SAT reaches 93, and that's a hard stop. Don't go any farther. No more attempt. I don't care if you've almost got it. Uh, if the tube is not in the trachea at that point, pull back, uh, get, the, <clears throat> get your supraglottic airway or eye gel uh, or whatever it is, and slide it into the patient's mouth and bag them up a little bit. Now... Uh, there's this concept of apneic oxygenation that we'll need to embrace too. Why am I telling you all this stuff? We, we, if we let the patient uh, get hypoxic, sometimes they get really, really hypoxic. Uh, and it's hard to reverse that trend. By the time you realize that the patient's sat is 88, it's almost certainly going to drip back down to 82, 80, 75 before you actually get the patient either intubated or re-oxygenated. They're going to get really hypoxic. This is a, a graph from that guy I talked about, Jeff Jarvis's paper. <clears throat> um, what this is, these are individual airway attempts. This line up here at the top is where the SPO2 started during the intubation attempt. This is with drugs and uh, uh, sedation and everything, paralytics. Up here at the top of the, each bar is where the SAT started when the intubation attempt started. And at the bottom is where the SAT ended up. And you'll notice that not infrequently uh, are these patients not only starting low, but they drop, even if they're relatively well oxygenated, they'll drop to 55, 60, 65, something like that. That's fairly hypoxic. All these guys, even these guys up here, are still getting into the mid-80s uh, on each one. And this is how people die, uh, because they start falling off the cliff. And by the time they get over the edge of the cliff, it's so hard to reach over and pull them back up uh, that, that it's a real problem. So we can't let these patients get hypoxic. Once you paralyze somebody or you stop providing uh, them any breaths at all, um, their hemoglobin starts to desaturate. In a normal, healthy adult, we can realistically hold our SAT above 90 for what is about eight minutes or so. And even then, they don't get really critically hypoxic till about nine minutes. Uh, but that's a normal adult. In an obese adult, uh, that time goes down to like three minutes, if that, two minutes before they start to fall off the curve. And a kid is a little bit less. And even in the moderately ill person who sat's 95, uh, they've only got about four minutes or so. And you'll eat up that time relatively quickly. <clears throat> is there something we can do to take all these folks and push them towards this blue curve? Uh, yeah, the idea of apneic oxygenation. What is this? You take a nasal cannula. You stick it on the patient's nose, and it's not a capno cannula, it's the one with the actual prongs that actually sticks into the patient's nose. Stick it on the patient's nose. Uh, you may have anything else going on in the patient at the same time. You turn it up to 6, turn it up to 12, turn it up to 15, and then turn it beyond 15 until the dial on the regulator stops turning. <clears throat> so you have probably 25 liters a minute flowing through that nasal cannula, or trying to. Uh, and by the way, it's not going to make the nasal cannula explode. I had an RT yell at me the other day, like, oh, it's only designed for 6 liters a minute. It's, it's going to be all right. It's going to be fine. Uh, it, it, it will take it. Uh, it. Everything is going to be fine. Turn the thing up to 25 uh, liters per minute. Turn it up as high as you can, which is going to make this terrible noise. But what it will do is provide a little bit of pressure uh, going down through the uh, posterior pharynx, through the nasal pharynx, uh, into the posterior pharynx, <clears throat> down into the trachea. And the fact that your blood is absorbing oxygen out of the 
um, <clears throat> out of the, the gas sitting in your alveoli creates a little bit of a concentration gradient, and it'll draw passively some more oxygen down there just because it's going down the concentration gradient. Um, so that's apneic oxygenation. You don't have to be breathing at all. Your body will just sort of, as long as your heart's beating, your body will take up the oxygen uh, to, a, to at least some extent. It gives you a longer time uh, in which you can avoid the patient becoming apneic, like uh, in this case, like 1.7 minutes in this study, and has fewer rates of complications. Same thing in kids. This is just an idea. If you put a nasal cannula on them, they don't get hypoxic. Uh, <clears throat> and if you keep, if you don't put a nasal cannula on them, they get hypoxic within, you know, here's two minutes ish, uh, here's three minutes ish, uh, which could be your entire intubation time. So don't let the patient get hypoxic. Again, when you get to 93%, we should stop using the ET tube and switch over to the supraglottic airway. If they've never gotten above 93%, then use the supraglottic airway, uh, and you can try to bag them up afterwards if you're not. Did we do it right? Did we get the thing right? How do we know? Well, the patient didn't suffer physiologic uh, manifestations, i.e. they didn't get hypotensive or hypoxic. And for us, did we get the thing in on the first shot? And why does it matter if you get them on the first shot? Why is the dash 1A the 1A there? The reason the 1A is there is because you increase your chance of complications with every uh, attempt at intubation. And that could be nausea, or that could be vomiting, that could be uh, <clears throat> airway obstruction, that could be severe hypoxemia, that could be hypotension or cardiac arrest. The chance of bad stuff happening on your second or third or fourth attempt goes up to about 75%, somewhere close in there, um, <clears throat> by the time you get to about your fourth attempt. And it goes up in sort of an um, exponential curve where your first chance, there's probably a 15%, first attempt, there's probably a 15% chance of something bad happening. Second attempt goes up to about 50 uh, and then it starts to level off up there to some extent until it takes off again. Regardless, the first shot is the best shot. So did we get a definitive airway sans hypoxia on the first attempt? That is the metric about whether or not this was a truly, yes, this is a uh, successful one, or is there something we could do better? Sometimes there's nothing you can do better. You might also ask, like, well, wait a minute. You said definitive airway. Definitive airway, DA, is um, an ET tube. And you told us to put in a supraglottic airway, and you're going you're gonna to harangue us uh, when it was 93, and I could have gotten the tube in the first place. Well, if you actually look at, say, the gamut stuff, which is uh, critical care transport metrics, what are they saying? Successful advanced airway device placement, <clears throat> tracheal tube, cricothyrotomy tube, or a supraglottic airway during first attempt without associated hypoxemia or, or hypotension. Um, now you could get down into the weeds about what is an actual attempt. I'm going to say that if you got a little bit hypoxic, you got down to 93 as you were attempting to intubate, immediately pulled out, uh, snuck a supraglottic airway down there, that works for me. Um, because in my mind, it's still sort of the same <clears throat> still sort of the same thing. You could even like keep the laryngoscope in there for a second uh, to hold the tongue up out of the way or something like that. Nonetheless, what I'm saying is this is our metric for it. This is how we know that we're in the right spot. Don't worry about uh, not getting the thing on the first attempt. We'll do something to try to increase our intubation success rates if we have to. Uh, but if you are getting the supraglottic airway in the patient and they oxygenate well and they ventilate well and they don't get hypotensive and they don't get hypoxic, uh, it doesn't really matter that much to me which, which thing actually went into the patient's mouth. <clears throat> so this is perfectly acceptable. You could surgerize somebody uh, through use of an eye gel. It works fine, except there's one problem with this uh, picture, and that is this eye gel is not in the right spot. How do I know it's not in the right spot? Because it does not have end tidal CO2 measuring on the end of it. Waveform end tidal CO2 measuring, no tube, nothing is, no airway device is in the right spot until you see a waveform pop up on the screen from your waveform end tidal CO2 monitoring. Every tube, every time, every mask we put on a patient's face needs an end tidal CO2 uh, waveform detector on the end of it that we are using to visualize and make sure that there is gas exchange happening there. Otherwise, the tube is not in the right spot until you can get that waveform to, come, to pop up. All right, let's sum up with this stuff. First of all, if we're gonna intubate somebody or manage any airway, we're gonna keep the head of that elevated, 20, 30 degrees. Are they on a backboard? Ugh, raise the head of the bed. Uh, things will get a little bit better. And for God's sake, why are you putting somebody on a backboard on a bed? What's wrong with you? Anyway, head of bed elevated. Get them in the sniffing position, the ear to sternal notch position, uh, their head translated forward and slightly extended, uh, just like I showed you. <clears throat> Use pre-oxygenation. 
and use whatever means are available, non-rebreather mask, a non-invasive positive pressure, CPAP, BiPAP, or BVM with a nasal cannula underneath the BVM, cranked up to uh, 25, uh, crank the BVM up to 25, and then uh, also keep a PEEP valve on there, and you'll be doing good stuff for the patient. We should be doing apneic oxygenation during any airway attempt, not just intubation, but while you're using an eye gel or anything else, uh, use an ap you do apneic oxygenation with nasal cannula. You should be able to sedate and paralyze people because that increases the chance that you are going to do things right on the first shot and makes it easier. And there are some people that you're just not going to be able to do without sedation and paralysis. You have to be somewhat good at it though. You have to recognize that when you get to 93% on your SAT that it is time to stop and to switch over to a supraglottic airway. And then you should be using the bougie first each time <clears throat> because it will increase the chance to get in the right spot and no tube is in the right place without an entitled CO2 waveform capnography detector on the end of it and hooked up to a monitor and giving you a waveform. If you don't see a waveform, tube is in the wrong spot. I don't care what his breath sounds are, tube is in the wrong spot until you get that waveform. I'll show you this one more time. This is an expanded version of that little graph I showed you before from uh, Jarvis's paper. They implemented basically this bundle, a little bit different, but, uh, but not a lot, um, implemented basically this bundle in their service. This was what happened before they implemented this bundle of stuff. This is what happened after. And again, this is where your SAT starts. This is where your SAT ends at the end of your airway attempt. And you notice <clears throat> that SAT starts a lot better SAT ends a lot better, and you avoid these down here. These may happen. These little guys, sometimes you can get down to 84%, something like that. These guys down here, the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the 20s, these are the guys that we absolutely can't have, and you avoid that with this. So these are good things. One of the keys to it is that we got to be able to aggressively manage the airway, and the way we got to be able to do that, to me, is with drugs and we should use all aids available to us. We can't be limiting people because we've got this theoretical fear that, well, now he's paralyzed. Well, he was in bad shape before and he was up creek to start with. I think adding a little bit of drugs to it is probably not the worst thing in the world. So, in fact, probably not not the worst thing in the world. It's probably the best thing for the patient because, remember, there's somebody coming to get you at basically all times, and that's why we're intubating them. So, do the right stuff, be aggressive, and... Uh, Go get them.